I'm Scott Mansfield, and this is Go Time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of Go Time. Uh, today, we have a special guest with us, um, but first we'll go through uh, who the typical hosts are. Uh, I'm Eric St. Martin. We also have Brian Kettleson. Who does not sound like Brian Kettleson today, but I assure you it is the real Brian Kettleson. Say hello, Brian. Today, the part of Brian will be played by somebody with a very scratchy voice. <laughs> we also have Carlicia Campos. Glad to be here. Hello. And our special guest today is Scott Mansfield, who we've talked about a couple times on the show um, about Rend and uh, a couple of other posts we've read. Uh, welcome to the show, Scott. Hello, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So, so uh, you you decided to heckle uh, last show. So I guess the punishment is you have to be on the show now. <laughs> yeah, so, like I said, I need to learn to keep my mouth shut sometimes. <laughs> so, Scott, you work on uh, some products at Netflix using Go. You want to give everybody a little background? Sure. Uh, so the project is called Rend. And it's a memcached proxy and server. It's written in Go. It was a interesting choice of language because Netflix is pretty much an all Java shop. And we needed something that was more performant, more productive, and uh, less, not bloated, but uh, doesn't have any baggage in terms of platform libraries and other things that every other Java app here pulls in. Um, we also wanted to have some sort of performance uh, because we're the the service that I work on is actually called EV Cache. So that's a uh, it's a distributed sharded memcached, and we're very latency sensitive. So having a eighty millisecond GC in Java would be great for a lot of people, but for us that would be horrendous. So we um, picked Go. So that's that's interesting. If you don't mind me interrupting, um, a lot of people are still very twitchy about Go's garbage collection. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why um, Go's garbage collection worked out well for you when Java's couldn't? There's a variety of reasons. Partially, the Go memory model itself is simpler and has less indirection, which allows the garbage collections to be faster. But really, it was sort of a let's just create the program in Go and we'll see how it works. It, it didn't really start out as a, as a work project. It ended up being a personal project that I uh, was working on before. And really, whenever, we, whenever I started to load test it, it actually turned out to be quite fast. Um, and, the, and the garbage collections themselves haven't, um, they happen all the time, but we don't really notice because they're only a couple hundred microseconds. Not too bad. So is this the first project within Netflix to adopt Go, or is there other ones? I actually don't know when the other ones started. There's a, there's a bunch there, uh, a bunch here, I should say. Um, there's, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the Chaos Monkey uh, system. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's actually a new version of uh, the Chaos Monkey coming out. It's not, it's not open source yet, um, but there's a, the whole back end of the Chaos Monkey is, has been rewritten in Go. And it's actually in production right now, striking fear into everybody's hearts here, you know. Uh, and really, it was a... I, I, I actually spoke to the developer before this to get some reasoning. And partly it was because Go itself is, is so easy to learn that he's not worried about people coming in and working on his code later the old code base was actually such a mess that people were afraid of changing it. So now he's rewritten it in Go. No, that's awesome. Because in, until now, I love everything Go does. And now it's wreaking chaos on my systems, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is now both evil and good. Now, I wanted to ask you, with, uh, with a project, a, a 
library, the, the REN library being so in need of performance? Did you apply specific techniques? Uh, did you apply any design concepts? Uh, did you use uh, specific libraries to make it as performant as possible? Or did you just apply good Go idioms and it just it came out performing well and that was it? Interesting enough, there's, well, I, I'm trying to parse the whole question. There's a lot of pieces there. Um, there's sometimes the good Go idioms can be less performant than if you try doing something lower level, such as ownership of data with a Go routine and then sending messages back and forth with channels may not be quite as performant as doing some sort of atomic integer like increment stuff. Um, so actually on that point, so um, Rend actually has no external dependencies. It's strictly standard lib go. And that was partially because I'm afraid of picking a vendoring tool whenever the, it's, it's still up in the air, but also because I could really, like I, I could solve our problems better by having a custom solution. And one of the one of the things that's actually a good example is our metrics library because I there's all kinds of um, metrics libraries out there that are you know you have a counter struct and then you go and increment it and it still does like atomic increments in the background but it's really didn't fit our use case quite as much. Is your metrics library also in Go? Uh, yeah, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, it's all in the same repository. Oh. Because I was thinking to ask you as well, I'm not sure if it applies, but I want to ask anyway, if you're using anything like, um, if you're using uh, Prometheus to collect metrics and, and log information. Yeah, so our deployment is actually quite interesting. We have on the same server, we're running um, Rend, Memcached, our uh, L2 disk-backed, solution called mnemonic which reuses part of the rend code and a java based sidecar process that's actually the hook into the rest of the ecosystem so in in netflix we have a a system called atlas that does our metrics collection and the client for that is in our prana sidecar so for us we actually have the sidecar process pull rend to pull metrics out every once in a while instead of rend actually pushing metrics anywhere and now the mnemonic part of it was the rocks db portion of rend right yeah from your article we should probably back up a little bit too because we discussed it a little bit in another show but we might want to kind of talk about like what rend is um and kind of the components of that and what what you're using it for to kind of give a better understanding of um what it does and why performance was so critical okay uh, yeah, so earlier as i mentioned i work on on evcache which is a distributed sharded memcached e. It's, um, I don't know, a second or third highest volume system that we have here. It's a, it's a cache that fronts pretty much everything. I mean, not everything, everything, but um, quite a lot. It's uh, in all three of our Amazon regions. It does, we hit 30 million operations per second globally um, earlier this year. So when we're talking about like um, trying to save a couple microseconds or something here or there it's because it happens 30 or it's because it happens a couple trillion times a day uh, so when we put something in front of memcached you really didn't want to slow it down so much that's why i was so sensitive to having uh something like 80 millisecond gcs our our clients actually normally see a uh, like one millisecond roughly response time from us and half of that is network latency. Wow. Um, so the purpose of Rend actually, so for us, we, Netflix as a whole has changed into a uh, N plus one architecture globally. So what that means is any member can be served from any region that we have. We operate in three AWS regions. And as um, the caching layer for the company, we actually do global data replication and it's partly to support this N plus one architecture. It gets really expensive though, when you have all of this, uh, data that's m stored multiple times in Ram when it's really only read in one region. So the purpose of this overall project that we called Moneta was to store some of that cold data on disk 
and allow the hot data to still be served from RAM as fast as it could be, but the cold data would be um, a much cheaper storage. As a part of that now, um, REND is the on-box memcached proxy that does, uh, it, it's a wire compatible memcached proxy, meaning it, our client didn't change at all. It still uses the same Java memcached client that we were using before. Um, that's actually is sort of the secret sauce of the EV cache product. And that's it speaks to REND. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying that's one of the things I found um, most interesting was that you kind of got like this layer one, layer two built in, except um, it was wire compatible. So you didn't really have to rewrite anything to use the new caching layer. You just talked to it as if it was memcached. Yeah. So our upgrades are pretty much just doing another deployment um, and we get instantly more efficient storage. Now, do you have anything special between the two layers? Um, did you implement uh, like bloom filters or anything like that to save uh, seeking the data off disk if it doesn't exist there for cold data? Or is it almost guaranteed to exist when you're looking for it in memcached in your particular use case? Not necessarily true. When you do things like Chaos Kong, where we evacuate a single region and split it between the other regions, you might have a huge number of misses uh, in L1 very quickly. Um, so I, I didn't actually work on the Rocks TV part. My teammate Vu Wen did a lot of work to make that very efficient. Um, the part that he's reusing is just like the protocol parsing piece, like the server loop piece of Rend, but the backend storage is all him. And uh, there's a variety of different ways he's made the storage efficient enough to be able to handle misses like that. Yeah, Rocks TV has been a, a favorite of mine for a long time. So I'm, I'm kind of jealous you guys got to build something really cool with it. <laughs> <laughs> so um walk us through kind of like the the performance of that like what you, you said spoke to kind of like uh having to kind of go against the idioms to get the type of performance that you are the one millisecond latency on that um is there a lot of those that you had to go by do you have kind of like a running list of uh things like that that uh kind of patterns reproducible patterns to get to perform some operation in a more performant way than is currently idiomatic uh, not so, I mean, part, part of it was, um, the design is basically the design itself is, is less, I'm trying to think of the proper words here. Most people might immediately think like, okay, send messages back and forth so that you could do requests. But for us, we have like a connection coming in as a connection going out. So we have these sort of vertical slices and it, it's a very strictly connected, um, like one connection into one connection out. And that allows us to have um, both isolation, but also a little bit easier time programming. There, there's not too many places, I don't think, where I've like bucked the trend. I've just tried to avoid over abstraction. So for the, for the metrics library, for example, counters are atomic integers, and it's a pretty straightforward thing that you would think to do. Right. And there's been a couple of in instances. Um, what was it that we were talking about uh, the other week? Uh, HECA that had, uh, he, he believed that they had overused channels too, and that they could have got much better performance had they just stuck to, you know, using mutexes and, you know, atomic integers and things like that, instead of all the channels that got used. Yeah. So and I think naturally we want to use all this stuff because it's cool and it's new and the languages that we came from didn't have them. And I, I totally abuse, I should go to jail for my abuse of channels when I first came in to go. <laughs> I wanted to use them for everything. I think that's, that's a pretty common pattern, though. Everybody comes in and, oh, look, concurrency, parallelism, channels everywhere. And then we calm down. That happened to me to um, use, use channels and ask for uh, some, some advice about my codes and people were like, uh -uh, just use a mutex here. So uh, I would say just throw it out there if, for people who are starting out. Learn how to use a mutex. So you can then make a choice if that's what you need versus channel. So a lot of times that's enough. And this, this performs a lot better. I also think it's important to remember that nothing is magic. So for a channel, there is a fast path. Think, think um, buffer channel, not the one where you need a handshake where there's no buffer. But for a buffer, there's no magic. You have... Um, pretty smart code at the front whenever you're trying to insert something. But if you end up um, competing for that, it's, it's a lot. That's the way it works. You can't have 
there's you can't have anything else there so it's not like you're going to magically be faster by having this channel for concurrency it's it it has to have some sort of management of of that concurrent behavior internally yeah and i know some of the stuff too um people and this is one of the things i was guilty of early on was using channels for state right like when i should really be using a mutex i, I would create kind of these like go routines that select on channels and that's where the updates took place to state and it was that seemed like the pattern because you know go ahead channels why would you want mutexes and this was in the early days but still i i still see people coming to the language and doing that and uh i yeah i don't know what the best way to offer advice for that is too you know whether there's kind of when to use channels when not to use channels but i think i have a pretty good idea if you're at netflix scale then <laughs> then all of the rules don't apply but if you're not at netflix scale use whatever you want i think we we probably spend too much time focusing on tiny micro performance benchmarks when, you know, 90% of our latency comes from the network and the disk and the database. And we should worry about those things instead. But my, my impression though, is that mutex and channels, they are not interchange interchangeable. I mean, you can't use channels in, in, in a way that you would, if you, if you, all you needed was a mutex, you can, force the, ch the channel a ch a design with channels in your codes but they're not really the same thing i could be wrong no they're not they're, they're not at all right um the, the only way it ends up working that way is because you end up um having one go routine that is the thing always updating um state so it, it's almost used that way but i think the pattern kind of came from I think there were some projects early on that had that pattern and then a lot of people kind of copied it and followed suit yeah. um which is uh, you know i can't even remember what what library i picked that pattern up on and then i kept doing it and there were there were other big name go programmers doing the same thing too so and i think we finally realized to slap our own hands like why <laughs> why are we doing this like the code's much more complex it's harder to reason about and it's not any it's it's actually less performant so and while you're on the subjects, I just want to mention this real quick. If you do figure out that a mutex is not going to do it for you and you do need to use, a, use channels, uh, if you haven't, it's worthwhile to watch a Rob Pike's video on a concurrency design in Go. I think that's what the name is. I'll put the, the link on the, on the show notes. It's beautiful. It's not something that you watch and, it, oh, I learned everything. But you get a sense of the different ways you can design for concurrency. And so it's gorgeous. It's, it's my favorite video ever for uh, Go. Have you guys seen that? Yeah. 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 Of course. So for Rend, is that pretty much done? Or are you actively like, kind of maintaining it? Or are you adding new features? Uh, well, at this point, it's mostly done. Uh, it's got a couple new things I'm adding to it, mostly to support new memcached commands because we're supporting each one very explicitly. Sometimes I have to go in and edit code to add support for things like append or prepend or, or other things like that. It's, it's in a pretty stable state at this point, actually. It's, it's being used in production for us already, so I would call that stable. Now, are you going to continue to support uh, changes so that it stays wire compatible with uh, memcached D, or are you just kind of staying at the current version? Does it support all the commands that memcached D offers? It doesn't really support everything that memcached D offers, and there's no plan to be completely 100% wire compatible because there's some things that we just simply don't use. We have a uh, our EV cache Java client that we vend to people does not expose everything, so we don't worry about supporting everything. Okay. It's it's a it's a very pragmatic approach because we it, it's meant to solve Netflix problems and it's open source in the hope that it will help somebody else solve their problems as well. Yeah, and I I don't think that there's a need to be 100 percent either, right? Um, like there's a big project that came out of YouTube called the Test too, which is wire compatible with MySQL but kind of uh, makes MySQL distributed, and they don't support all SQL in there as well. Just kind of the core things that, that they use. And that's okay. 
Yeah, that's if definitely if it right. solves their problem, right? I agree. And if it does not solve your problem, pull requests accepted. <laughs> or forks. Oh, right. Or or forks. So um kind of on a different track here. Uh, was it yesterday, the day before I came across uh, another one of your blog posts, which I actually love, which is called uh, How to Block Forever in Go. <laughs> so that was kind of like a list of like all the different ways or these just things you came across where people would create uh, deadlocks in code? Um, not strictly. Uh, so I had been actually it's I think still in the in the rent code, I had been making a new um, wait group and then adding one and trying to wait on it so I could block forever in my main. And of course, I thought that was a little bit absurd. Um, so a while ago, we were talking in, in the Gophers Slack about this, and um, I mentioned like ways to block forever, and then other people started piling in and adding suggestions and other things. And I thought it was kind of funny because there was just, I, I don't know how many of you are listed here. Yeah, there's... There was probably 10 or, or more. There was, there was quite a few, and I actually have one that's missing. And yeah, that's the, that's the great thing about it is I learned the proper way to do it, uh, which is the runtime.go exit, I think, in the main, which allows you to exit out of your main, but um, allow every other go routine that you've started to keep running. So that's like the, the proper way to do it. And I didn't know that. Um, it's one of the wonderful things about putting something out there is people will come correct you, but that means you actually get to learn the right way to do it. So wait, what was it? You you said runtime dot exit. Uh, it's called go exit. I believe. Or yeah, go yeah, yeah. Some yeah, something along those lines. I can't remember now. It's one of those things like you have to be there, like ready to type it, and then it comes to your mind. Well, nowadays you don't even have to do that, right? Because editor plugins. <laughs> yeah, Vim go. But yeah, the one that I uh, I remember not being on the list is um, a nil channel will also block forever. So if you try to send or receive on a nil channel, it will block forever. Aha. Uh -huh. I need to add that now. I feel like it's not complete. <laughs> I think it should just be like a never ending list that evolves. Yeah, that's the power of the internet. You can go back and edit it. Nobody will ever know. And for anybody who's listening who has not seen this post, we'll link to it in the show notes. But it's basically like this running list of different things you can do um, that would end up making your 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 program kind of deadlock where a go routine or the application itself just blocks forever and it, it was it was a fun read because i'm going through there and like 90 percent of them i've seen or done you know mistakenly like oops <coughs> you know and like the one of them that i saw was like the double lock that one was fun because although i've never done it that way where you lock twice in a row i have locked in a function and then called another function that locked the same mutex and basically made it wait forever. I did that this week. Oops. Yep. Oops. And I feel like some of them, uh, some of the static analysis tools that are out there could be kind of evolved to look for some of these patterns. I mean, some of them are runtime specific, right? Like you can't know that the channel is going to stay empty forever, right? But um, others, like the double locking, I feel like you should be able to catch um some of those i guess i don't know i shamefully i have not written a static analysis tool so <laughs> it should be easy <laughs> right for anybody who writes static analysis tools it's hey it's just it's no different than the business delivering requirements right it's, right. it's just a button how hard could it be just add the button just slap some regex on it and you're good to go right regex solves all the problems all right. So anybody have anything else they want to talk about uh, Netflix or the usage at Go of Go there or other things? What else are you working on, Scott? Do you have anything else going on in the open source community? Um, I mean, we Netflix steal? does certainly for sure. Uh, I actually had this like list of, of Go projects written down, but I, it's not necessarily um, perfect for this. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of things. I've, I've linked them all actually to you guys already um, that are all open source and are related to go use here um but my myself personally no i've um pretty much been stuck working on rand this whole time such is the life of a, de of a developer <laughs> so okay so um I, i'll have to look for that link but we'll make sure that's in the show notes too for anybody who's interested in all the kind of projects that are coming out of netflix 
um, that are open source. And even outside of Go, Netflix has been releasing a lot of cool stuff. Forever. Yeah. Netflix, in my mind, is, is one of the pioneers of the open sourcing our tools so that you can use them group. And, you know, we're not at the free software Friday bit yet, but you got to throw down for Netflix because they've been helping everybody else build awesome environments for a long time. Yeah. I, I mean, long before it was as trendy as it is now. Yeah. And, and I mean, you have to give credit too, because I mean, we're, we're Go developers and it's, it's one of the primary things we all love, but I mean, we were other language developers too, right? It's almost impossible to solely develop in one language these days. So, and there's plenty of other projects um, that Netflix and other companies that have released that are Java and all that jazz that we, we've gotten some good use out of over the years. So uh, speaking of kind of projects and news, do you guys want to kind of just have a, a random round table about uh, things going on in the community and projects we're interested in and playing with? I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Your ready. voice is clearing up there, Brian. You feeling better? I muted my microphone and coughed quite a bit. It helped a lot. <laughs> so one of the big things that happened this week was uh, GoKit was tagged at 0.1.0. And I think that's a really big milestone for GoKit. It was kind of an arbitrary tag. When I talked to Peter about it, he said there wasn't anything gigantic that made it into a, a, a one tag. But um, they've got thousands of users and they're, they're drawing this line in the sand and saying, hey, this is a, a point where we're stable and, and worthy of, of a release milestone. Uh, the, Go pack, the GoKit packages are really nice because they're usable Outside of, of GoKit microservices, um, the logging package is amazing. I really like their logging package a lot. And they've got lots of little packages that are easy to use outside of the entire GoKit ecosystem. So if you haven't looked at GoKit yet, please do. Um, lots of good stuff there. And they've got a great, vibrant community that helps uh, push that GoKit code forward. So is this more of kind of marking a stable API where the API won't change much? I don't think there's any significant guarantee of API stability in this release, but it's, it's just kind of a, a, it's a, a confidence tag. Yeah, exactly. It's a milestone. Yeah. Go has been doing some great things and I use their log package too. I'm, I'm quite fond of it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. It's a good log. package. In, in one FYI, Peter was on the change log podcast. I listened to that show, that episode and he goes over the components of the package and he talks about, stability and in releasing like moving towards a stable release is a very good show now uh scott what are you doing for logging because you said you don't use any external dependencies so did you write your own logging package or are you just using the standard library um generally you just stay quiet when everything's okay um we rely a lot on metrics because um at in AWS, you can have instances just sort of up and disappear. We, we run oh, I, somewhere between 11 and 12,000 instances. So we're not gonna worry about the logs from one instance most of the time. Um, if we do log, it's when something's already completely wrong and we're going to like close the connection or something like that. And therefore I don't really worry so much about it. We just use the log package. Hmm. So this is more just kind of uh, to be able to triage uh, errors you're seeing in your metrics of kind of system performance and latencies and things like that, then you kind of go after the fact to, to triage. So you don't really use as much of like the, the tagged logging and stuff like that that other people use. No, certainly not. We just, uh, every time that I have an error that's a very specific situation, I just put a metric and um, if that counter goes anywhere above zero, then we know specifically what went wrong. Uh, that's true too, right? I mean, because ultimately that's what a lot of people do anyway, right? They tag their their errors of certain types and then they try to query them and, and get counts of them and all that stuff. So you're just kind of skipping the, the bloat of having all those logs sitting around and just keep the thing that matters to you, the count. Now, does that mean that, that you have uh, watches on those metrics to trigger events or notifications? Yeah, so if there's anything that we know would be like catastrophic, we could work on on having alerts and other things on those. Um, but having, I don't know, I, I feel like an atomic in integer increment 
uh, and reading it once a minute is is far more lightweight than writing out a whole big JSON blob. Very nice. But JSON, it's it's so slimmed down in comparison <laughs> to XML. <laughs> and human readable too. Right. <laughs> so we've we've turned our podcast into SREs at Netflix. Uh, we're going to have to change our branding, but I think you're getting a lot of good, valuable information out there, guys. Yeah, I, I, find, I always find it interesting, too, to talk to different people who work at scale, right? Because anytime you get into distributed systems, and especially the size that Netflix is, you can't be concerned about a single machine anymore. It's impossible to do that. So I always find it interesting to see what people's approach is to make sense of the massive amounts of data and metrics and logs and all that jazz. And it especially became interesting when he said he used no outside dependencies. All right. So moving on, what else we got? So I, I, uh, you're gonna... I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say two of our, our perennial favorite projects here at GoTime are Vimgo and Hugo. They both uh, leveled up this week with some updates. I haven't read the Hugo announcement yet, so I don't know what's new there. And Vimgo had some interesting changes for um, implementing interfaces, I think you were telling me, Eric. Yeah, and... so I don't even know how you would, you would pronounce this command. Right. Like it's just like uh, go fumped. Right. I would never expect it to be pronounced fumped until I heard someone say it. So I don't know how you would pronounce the command, but go impl or implement or. Um, but it's cool because it allows you to it basically stubs out your type with all the functions so that it will implement said interface. Which nice. is really cool. Very nice. I haven't, I haven't used it yet, but it sounds like something I would use. Yeah, me too. So how about you, Eric? Did you come across any interesting projects or news this week that you wanted to share? Um, so I, I saw um, Francesc's, uh, uh, what do you call it? Go tooling in action video, which I thought was really cool. Did oh, anybody watch that? That is a great video. Yes. Scott, did you get a chance to see that? I have not yet. So it was kind of cool because I was like watching people work too. So, and he kind of walks through kind of some of the tools that he uses and how to use them and I even saw him do the, the new fancy uh, uh, torch graphs that Uber supplied, which I have to say is a much uh, easier way to visually see uh, PPROF graphs. Yeah, they're pretty. Have you played with that one yet, Scott? The Go Torch project? Yeah, the Go Torch project. Um, well, the guy who invented flame graphs actually works here on our SRE team. Oh, so nice. Um, it's a pretty well ingrained use uh, like for Java apps here. People use it all the time. Um, and only recently have I actually started using GoTorch. I've, I've been stuck in the stone ages, apparently using the, uh, the web graph output from the PPROF tool. You're not the only one. I do the SVG thing too. <laughs> Scott, I think that's the closest we've ever come to a mic drop on GoTime. Thank you for that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We invented those. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you. Not, not we, Brendan Gregg. I, all credit goes to him. He's, in, he's really, really great at what he does. He's, yeah, he's, he's like the godfather of performance, though, right? Like, I've got his book on my desk over here, <laughs> which I still haven't made it all the way through. Like, what happens with getting older and having less time? Like, I just, I don't get it. Somebody invent more time. Could you write that in Go, please? <laughs> Did so you have another, any, I'm, I'm sorry. I was Andy. just going to ask Scott, did, did you have any projects you wanted to kind of talk about? I, I kind of keep my head in the sand. Um, I've, been, I've been working on some features that we need for Rend to, uh, to be deployed. And um, we had all kinds of things going on recently. So um, unfortunately, no. I, I also have a, um, eight, God, she's eight months old now. I have an eight-month-old daughter. So all my free time is pretty much spent with her. That's a big external dependency right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, I, t I guess she's 20 months now. 20-month-old daughter woke up just before we got on the call for the show. <laughs> That's twice now. She, she times it perfectly. I think she knows. She's like, of course, I want to be on the mic, she too. <laughs> she likes attention. I so there was a, a future podcaster. I'll get her on the show when she can talk. I have a project I wanted to mention. Yeah. Uh, yet another web framework, YAWF. 
So is that actually the name of this project or is that what you've labeled it? No, this, uh, that's an acronym I just came up with. Uh, but the name of the project is IRIS. I don't think I've seen IRIS. So um, what's the spirit of it? Is it like closer to uh, like a, a Revel? Is it closer to like a, a Martini or a Negroni? Yes. Um, so HTTP router or he actually has a graph here that, that uh, he benchmarked. I'm assuming he's a he. Dick is a guy. He benchmarked he, the Iris uh, uh, package with uh, HTTP router, Gorilla Max, Gen, Vigo, Martini, uh, the standard lib package, and that's other ones that I never heard of. And he claims that it's 20 times faster. I learned of it from uh, Vinicius Pacheco when he did uh, one of the remote Go meetups, and he mentioned that he said he uses it and loves it. Uh, I haven't used it, but anything that says I'm 20 times faster calls my attention. So what's your feeling on this, Brian? What was it, episode two that you made the comment about? Uh, <laughs> can, can, <laughs> router we please, performance can we please stop making more routers for Go? Please. <laughs> we, we have some. They're great. And that's not really where your code is going to improve in terms of latency. So stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I heard the episode and I, I saw this and I had to mention it. Just to... <laughs> You're just trolling me, Carlos. Yeah, that's not nice. I have to try to get my way somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't even looked at it. I'll have to pull it up. I, recently, I haven't really been, I'm kind of in the Scott camp here where it comes to the frameworks. Um, recently, I've just been writing my own stuff. I just haven't, maybe I'm not building anything big enough. I feel like I need a uh, framework for for the repetitive nature of it, but. Or maybe you just don't want to take on another external dependency that you have to babysit. That, that's quite a possibility as well. Which is going to make it harder and harder for us to find interesting Go projects if we're never using any. That's very true too. I, I should probably make a point out of playing with new projects. It gets hard though. You get kind of trapped in your own little world building stuff. So um, uh, what was the other thing I wanted to talk about? Oh, the survey. Oh, Everybody that's right. The survey. The survey. I took the survey. So um, we're talking about, uh, there was a survey that went out. Uh, who sent that out? It was Ed. Ed Mueller. Ed's from, from, from that's, right. that's right. Yeah. So he sent out a survey kind of um, trying to gauge uh, people's usage of Go and the way they use it and the libraries they use and the vendoring tools they use. Maybe so we can agree on one so Scott can use one. <laughs> so have you tried any scott um i was forced to use go depths to deploy something on pivotal web services um even if i had i think i had one dependency and i just put it right in the vendor folder it would not actually compile and run my code without a go depths file wow so this, this is kind of like how i forced brian to use node one time <laughs> oh you still have PTSD from that? Didn't you did? Yeah, didn't we talk about this last week? Do we have? I to can't bring remember. I still can't remember what it was. I think it was like Jason Lint thing or some kind of tool like that. I had him install, and I didn't realize it was Node. And I'll never live it down. No, I I actually sent him an email and said, "Report to my office. You're fired." <laughs> so, um, Go Vendor, I like. I've been using that one recently. And that seems to be kind of almost the same thing, right? Like there's, it just uses the vendor folder that already exists and it kind of stuffs stuff in there. So I kind of like that one. I don't hate it. I should say that. So, but I think, yeah, I think you're right. Like we're still trying to get consensus as a community over um, what to use there. People have actually been frustrated. Um, for example, with the AWS SDK for Go, they don't use any sort of, um, vendoring tool and they just have every dependency in their vendor folder. People are upset with them and they keep opening issues, but I think their position is very pragmatic saying there's no clear winner. We're not going to pick one because somebody's not going to have that tool. Yeah. And that's kind of what I like about the go vendor thing, because it doesn't really do much aside from stuff, your dependencies in the vendor folder. At least from my understanding, I, I haven't seen any kind of manifest or, or anything like that. So. 
I've only recently started using it, but it seems to be that's all it does is stuff it into the vendor directory for you and do do the go gets for you and and stuff like that. So I kind of like that approach. But yeah, I'm still waiting for consensus on on what to use. But so one of the things with the vendoring I still haven't figured out is um, there's the and maybe somebody here can solve that for me is there's kind of the whole you don't you don't vendor dependencies in the library only in the command or do I have that flipped? Have you guys heard that where people are, are advocating kind of not to vendor dependencies for libraries? Yeah. So you actually had it right. It's mostly for just people who are writing libraries should have no, they shouldn't force a dependency because otherwise you end up running into diamond dependencies uh, very quickly. Yeah. And that one still is, is, so in in a lot of libraries, I think it makes sense, but there's others that are so big that kind of force the version. I guess may, maybe they should make at least recommendations. There should be something maybe in the documentation that says, you know, this library is known to work with these particular versions or something like that, or there's at least a minimum requirement. But if dependency management is not is not an easy thing, right? I think we all need Maven for Go. Oh my God. And, no. and that's where we're going to evolve to there. I don't think there's a middle ground. This is probably an episode of its own, but I don't really, I really don't think there's a middle ground and trust me, I don't like Maven either, but how, how can you only do part of dependency management? How can you, how can you only do half of that? I think we have to do it all and everybody has to do it all or nobody gets anything, but that's just my opinion. And if only people could scream at you right now, Brian, they are through okay. the airwaves. <laughs> it's all right. I, I think we talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, humility on the internet. I am perfectly happy to be wrong every day and have people tell me that because I learn from it. So I'm I'm accepting the fact that I'm wrong now too. I would like to point out that the uh, people of different the authors of different tools are actually talking to each other now, which is great. They're starting to to try to find a middle ground or some kind of um, consensus on what a, like a lock file should be or what kind of dependency resolution you should do so there's there is movement in that front but uh it still seems like a long way off yeah that's actually a a, a good observation I, i've kind of noticed that too like in the earlier days of people talking dependency management it was you know we we don't need it and then it was like okay maybe we need it a little bit and then there was like five tools and then there were 10 tools and there was arguments, but you're, you're right. I think that there's been a lot more kind of consensus. I think that the go team has kind of stepped in too and realized that maybe they need to kind of help facilitate this a little bit too, you know, even if they don't implement the tool, right. They gave us the vendor directory, which I think made the tools less intrusive. Um, we didn't have to do all the, the whole, go path mangling that was required for some of the tools earlier on so yeah i'm interested to see how it comes along and how long that takes and actually a lot of the discussion is happening in the slack there's a there's a vendor channel that people are talking in so if you want to follow along you can see the discussions happening and of course voice your own opinion if you feel the need brian just just keep it civil <laughs> That's that's a touchy subject for Go developers, and, and this our our Go for Slack has a very specific code of conduct. So you're you're gonna gotta touch something as deep as vendoring. Just remember to to be adult. I I think that the show has become like learn a new Slack channel every week. <laughs> <laughs> it's like every week somebody mentions a new channel, and like wow, I didn't know that existed. It's talking right. about channels and on Go for Slack. For people who are listening, hop on to the GoTime FM channel because we are we can all multitask here. We are very good at that, and you wouldn't believe it because we are we have Adam tweeting for us, and we are all on the channel also typing. Our guests are typing, and we're talking, doing all the things at all, at uh, the same time. So and, join and us and tackle us enough like Scott did. We might drag your butt on the show. <laughs> exactly <laughs> as punishment now is that concurrency or parallelism carlicia this uh, is concurrency for it's sure concur okay good yeah <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs>
<laughs> Good so, question. Uh, on that note, I think um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up this week is the uh, season three of Beyond Code, which featured GopherCon 2015. That's launching this Saturday, and it's going to be in the show notes for this call. <coughs> Excuse me, still sick. Um, Beyond Code season three has uh, interviews from lots of the people that went to GopherCon, and it's really awesome. I, I just saw some of the previews and, and really enjoyed it, asking interesting questions of the people in the Go community. So if you get a chance, check that out. It's really cool. Adam and his team did a fantastic job putting that together for us. And both Carlicia and Brian are on there. I ran yeah. and did. <laughs> Complete, <laughs> completely by chance. And I also want to mention that it was very late at night. They were way on the back of the bar. This was at one of the after parties. There were so many, I can't remember. Uh, it was huge. They were way in the back. So just by, just by the time I got to the end of the bar, I, I already had, I don't know how many beers. And so there is that. And everybody who was with me was drinking. And two other people who were with me are also on, on, the, on the movie. And I don't know how we all managed to just talk clearly i can't believe it now, so i felt is, like i was ambushed <laughs> adam this was is like people it's beyond code beyond code is the bar it is the real deal and uh but adam and uh was so great the, uh, uh, the power of making people feel comfortable behind the camera amazing uh, yes and jared amazing so they're gonna be at confercon again i highly recommend it just do it it's fun it was, it was like looking at a time capsule. That was me a year ago talking about Go and talking about things. And it was, it was fun to watch. Yeah. So, so you made the comment in, in that. And it, I think it's in the intro video um, we'll link to. And I'm sure Adam, if he hasn't sent it now, is, is sending it on the Twitter. Um, <laughs> uh, so you made the comment that everything, something like everything interesting in uh, the computing world is either written in Go or soon will be. How do you feel about that, that observation one year later? It's true. If you think about the, the things that are really shaking up our industry right now, uh, there's a short list and uh, on them <clears throat> are containers. Uh, the entire container industry is driven by Go, whether it's Docker or Kubernetes. You know, all of those pieces are written in Go. I think um, just... A plethora of tools that are coming out now for us are, are powered by Go, are written in Go, uh, go on the back end somewhere. So it, it's really neat to see that, that really start to come true. I find this interesting that it directly contradicts Atwood's law, which is any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think that's actually also true because I, I'm pretty sure there's already a JavaScript container engine. Right. I was going to say, uh, when we get off this call, I'm going to have to uh, to Google containers and JavaScript. If, if it's not written in JavaScript, there is probably at least bindings. Yeah, I'm sure there is. But I, I, I realize it's a bold statement, but I, I think it's, it's less hyperbole than it sounds. There's, there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening in Go. And a lot of the, the great things happening in computing right now have, have go in the middle of them somewhere. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. And we see more and more coming. I mean, look, we have, we have Scott on the show. Right. And, he, and by next year, he's going to have, I don't know, at least 10 more teams inside Netflix using Go, right, Scott? Sure. I just need to uh, convince them to move away from our big old Java platform. <laughs> and, and changing the wheels on a moving bus is never difficult, ever. No, but take look at the GopherCon sponsor list as an example. There are companies on there that, uh, you know, you wouldn't even have thought touched Go a year or two ago. And you know, there's there's some real surprises in there. It's really awesome to see it. All right. So I think we're actually running over time a little bit. Um, I know. Uh, so we, we typically each show we do kind of like a free software Friday hashtag. Um, where kind of each of us lists a project, kind of thanking them for uh, making our lives easier. So who wants to kick this thing off? I will. I stumbled across Jesse Frizzell's dot files about, I don't know, six months ago. And I realized, I think it was yesterday, perhaps, I realized that instead of 
doing a Google search or hitting Wikipedia or something like that. I really just needed to look in her dot files anytime I had a question about how to do something. So I can't recommend uh, those dot files strongly enough for you. They're on GitHub at jfrizzell slash dot files. Everything in the world you need to do is in there. There's some amazing stuff that you can learn from, from just cloning those dot files. So these are just your, your sane defaults by Jesse? Oh, it's, it's so much more than saying defaults by Jesse. This is, this is a, I don't even know, this is unicorns and rainbows in your shell. It's everything. And I know we looked through them for a couple of configurations. I can't remember what they were for. Uh, she had linked them to us on Twitter a while back. I think, I think it was for using uh, Mutt or something like that. That's, that's I think right. where the exploration started using happening. Mutt for email. So I, I put in the show notes, zero to awesome and one get clone. Uh, I stand by it. That's awesome. I'll go next. I'll follow Brian's uh, lead and not mention a software per se, because I couldn't come up with one today. I will mention this uh, open source book that I've been going through. It's called Networking, Network Programming with Go. So much of uh, Go is used for systems programming and networking, and I've been trying to learn more about it. And this book is great because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a thorough in terms of breadth, but it's uh, each subsection, you can just go on the internet and find videos and spend two hours or more learning about it, but it brings everything together. It goes over everything that is, at least it seems to me to be the case. And it, it has a lot of examples uh, of using Go and the standard library to do some of that work. And um, the, the name of the person, the guy is a professor. His name is Jan Newmarch. So he teaches at a university, I think. So that's my recommendation today. Nice. Now, Scott, how about you? You got anybody you want to thank? Um, well, I think I'm going to take the, the cheap way out and just say go. Um, that's honestly, cheap. though, the, the standard library being open source has allowed me to have a much deeper understanding of what actually happens when I say, for example, buff IO without write or something like that, it matters a lot for us. So being able to just very quickly go from docs to source code and, and follow the path allows me to, to really understand what's going on. Yeah, I don't think we consider that cheating. I think it's the one thing that makes all of our lives easier all the time. So I think kind of to everybody's point, like, we use, we use only a couple of tools every day. So I think we got to start stepping outside the box. So for me, and I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong because I don't think I've ever heard anybody pronounce it, but uh, it's actually a project called Radar or Radar 2 rather. Um, and it's not something I use every day, but it's, it, it is something I play with. So it's, uh, they call it a reverse engineering framework, but really it's kind of a disassembler and debugger. Um, so it kind of does some of the same stuff GDB does and all that jazz, but really um, it, serves kind of the same role that like Ida Pro does, um, but it's completely open source and there's Go bindings for it, which is awesome. So you can actually like script the disassembly and searching and patching of code using Go. So I've only tinkered with it a little bit, but it's something that I'm looking forward to playing with more, but it has like ASCII control flow graphs of the assembly and all kinds of fun stuff. So I'd like to see what I can do about kind of pairing it with Delve. Um, one day when I have, you know, infinite amounts of time. Tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> Later today, you know. <laughs> All right. So with that said, uh, I think we are, are, are probably well over time at this point. But I want to thank everybody for being on the show. I want to thank everybody for listening. Everybody who is chatting with us in the GoTime FM channel on Slack. Uh, Definitely. We are on iTunes too. So now everybody can share us through iTunes or just go to GoTime FM. Um, we do have a github.com slash GoTime FM slash ping. If you want to suggest um, people to be on the show or for us to ask questions or what else? Somebody to turn, Somebody needs to turn down the bass on Eric's voice. Yeah, I'm, I'm terrible about that. And then I think that's it. Uh, Twitter, GoTime FM on Twitter as well. So with that said, uh, bye, everybody. Thanks for being on, Scott. Sure thing. This was fun. Thanks, Scott. <laughs>